All right, Jackie, we are live. Take it away. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I am Jackie Hewn, Manager of Exhibits here at NACE International. NACE would like to thank you for joining us today for this webinar, From Leads to Sales, How to Improve Trade Show Lead Quality and Sales Conversion. This webinar will also will be posted on the NACE website under nace.org, Corrosion 2015, Exhibitor tab, the ROI Center. Uh, also under the ROI Center tab, you can also ac access the two replayable webinars we held last year. That's Driving Qualified Booth Traffic and Secrets of the Isles, along with a number of how-to exhibiting articles and an email uh, question, questions and answer program in the Exhibitor Invites program. This is all included on the NACE ROI Center uh, tab. So please, just go to the website if you need any other information on uh, the return on investment program we offer to all our exhibitors. Also, I would like you to feel free to share this webcast with any of your colleagues. So it is my pleasure now to introduce one of America's leading consultant, speaker, and educator, Mr. Jefferson Davis with Competitive Edge. All right. Thank you, uh, Jackie, um, and everybody who's taken time out of your schedule to log in to this uh, what I think is a critically important webinar on the topic of trade show lead management. Uh, I've been around the industry now, hard to believe, uh, heading on 30 years here, and um, have worked with hundreds and hundreds of exhibitors and also a lot of show organizers like NACE building programs to help exhibitors get better ROI. Um, if you ever want to talk trade shows, you got questions, you can reach me through the NACE Exhibitor Success and ROI Center. There's an Ask the Trade Show Expert. You can also email or call me direct. I uh, love talking trade shows, so feel free to call me. Um, so let's start off with a kind of a joke here. Actually, it's not very funny. I saw a, a rendition of this years back in a magazine, Business Marketing. It said, question, what's the difference between a fortune cookie and most trade show leads? And the answer is the fortune cookie might come true. <laughs> Well, that's got a little bit of humor to it when you think about what it really means. It's not really that funny, and yet it speaks to the heart of a very real challenge that we as exhibitors face, and that challenge is trade show lead management. So let's start off with some um, questions, kind of prime the mental pump questions, if you will. You will see a box in your workbook on page one at the top. Uh, when you think about your exhibiting program, and you think about leads, how important are leads to the overall value you get and the, the ultimate success that you get from trade shows? So go ahead and jot that down in terms of how important they are. Are they somewhat? Are they very? Are they critical? Are they the primary reason why you exhibit? Second, do you set specific lead goals for shows? Uh, do you go into the show with a very specific uh, lead goal, or is it more just kind of like a catch as catch can? Okay, and in fact, I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll on that topic uh, right now. I'd like to see uh, everybody who's logged on with me today uh, what is happening uh, in terms of setting lead goals. Click the radio dial button that applies. Yes, we do. No, we don't. Uh, we somewhat do. I'll give you just a moment. We're at about 70% of the votes. Over 80% are in. Uh, thanks for the fast response. 90%. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Um, so let me see. Something happened with my console. All right, I'm back. Um, the uh, results, let me share the results with you on the screen. One out of four of you logged in today said you do. Congratulations. 31% um, of you said you don't set lead goals, and I'm curious as to whether that is that leads aren't a real important part of your program, or you just don't really have a methodology for doing that. Uh, those of you who selected no, uh, if you would be willing to maybe, uh, but via the question button, just send me a word or two as to what's standing between you and setting goals. And 44% of you were in that somewhat range where you probably have a goal, but it's somewhat loosely defined and may, maybe it could be improved upon. 
So um, we're going to get into that today because uh, lead goals are a critical part of the program. Uh, we're also going to take a look at how you currently capture leads, the physical tool you use and your process, which we're going to tighten up. And then finally, uh, how many of you um, know what becomes of your leads? Uh, you capture them, you send them to sales or uh, dealers or distributors or independent reps, uh, and do you know what becomes of your leads? These are all some of the key questions and the things that we're going to work about, work through in the next 30, 40 minutes here. Okay? So uh, let's move into um, some of the insights on lead management. Uh, I'm going to make a pretty strong statement here. If your company wants to get return on investment, ROI from your exhibiting program, and you're not signing deals, writing orders on the show floor, and you ever hope to get ROI, you've got to accept that the real product of a trade show, the thing you walk out the door with is leads. Okay, so there's a very direct connection between trade show ROI and lead management. Again, unless you're signing contracts at the show, okay, which I doubt many of you are. Some of you probably are, but probably not that many. Here's three mind-blowing statistics on lead management, which are real um, head scratchers. 87% of the leads captured on the typical show floor in North America are never effectively followed up on. Three out of four salespeople, or 76% of the salespeople that receive trade show leads, view them as cold calls. That's pretty mind-blowing, isn't it? Somebody walked into your booth, engaged your staff, gave you information, and the people getting the leads are viewing them as cold calls? I, you know, I've got a real, real concern about that statistic. I think it's um, mind-blowing, and we have to do something about that. Uh, number four is another just head-scratcher, okay? 43% of attendees that go to trade shows with purchase intention receive information from exhibiting companies after they've made the buying decision. So the speed in follow-up, how fast we engage and how fast we do what we promised, uh, there seems to be a disconnect in that. I saw a study uh, by a, a company that said the average company takes 26 days, 26 days to move their leads from the capture in the booth to the field. That's three and a half weeks. That's way too long, way too long. Um, number five, I think the problem, the lead management problem, it really begins with the the perception that trade show leads aren't, aren't very va valuable or good, and it also with the capture process, which we'll walk through in here. And finally, the, the sixth insight, um, very few exhibitors appear to know what becomes of their trade show leads. And what's interesting about that insight is that sometimes you are getting a significant return on investment, but you can't see it because you have no way to track. You know, you exhibit at Corrosion, and nine months after the show, a 100000 quarter of a million dollar uh, order gets closed, and it was a direct result from a conversation in the Corrosion booth. But you can't trace it back, therefore no one even knows. So some of you are getting serious ROI, uh, but... If we can tighten up your, your lead management process, you can do a better job of linking the real value and the ROI you're getting from shows. Okay? So, why is this happening? I mean, those are some pretty mind-blowing stats. Number one, we already hit. There's a, a quality perception of trade show leads. Second, too often, marketing and sales are operating in silos. Uh, there's, there's a disconnect. Marketing selects, books, plans, and executes the show, and sales is asked or forced sometimes to actually come and work the show, um, and we're not on the same page. Uh, we're not really communicating and getting that we're all part of the same food chain here, which is customer value and customer acquisition. So we've got to bridge 
or close the disconnect between marketing and sales often. The third reason why I see a big part of it is the lack of exhibit skills training. 86% of the people that stand in a trade show booth have never had an hour of skills training on how to do this. They, somebody told them along the way that their job in the booth is to stand in there and talk and talk and talk and talk. Okay, uh, and, and, and it's really not it at all. What they really need to be doing is understanding who you're defining as your ideal visitor and asking more questions and capturing more and better information. Uh, the fourth uh, thing contributing to this lead problem is the lack of, of clarity on what a lead really is. And I'll talk about that in one of our best practices here. But, you know, so, you know a lot of people, someone walks in the booth and says, here's, a, uh, here's my badge, send me some information. They go, sure. They scan the badge and they go, woohoo, I got a lead. And I'm like, did you really? <laughs> was that a lead? Or was it something else? We will talk about that in a little more detail as we go on. And number five, the lack of a closed loop lead management system. If you're doing this right, if you've got a closed loop system in place, you should know the ultimate disposition, what becomes of every lead you capture. Okay, so, so and I'm going to walk through the four phases of a closed loop system and have you do some check down as to where you are on this. Um, but first, let's go, uh, grab, grab your pen, grab a calculator if you have one handy. I'm, I'm going to have you run two formulas here which are going to create a tremendous wake up and smell the concrete effect for any and everybody in your company. Okay. So number one is, if you're not calculating this metric already, you should be because it's important. Cost per lead. It is a very simple formula to run. You take your total show investment and you divide it by the number of leads you capture. I'm showing you a formula on the screen here. If you have the numbers from your last show, I'd like you to run it for your own, using your own numbers. $75,000 investment, 150 leads. $500. Now here's a question. Is that high? Is that low? Is that good? Is that bad? I don't know. It, it really depends on what you're comparing that to. The average cost of a trade show lead in North America is $360, 360. So on a surface level, I could look at it and go, wow, mine's a little bit higher than the average. But I think there's a more important number you need to be comparing cost per lead to. And that is your average sale amount. Example, if you have a $1,000 sale amount and a $500 cost per lead, you got a problem. 50% of your revenue will be devoured by lead acquisition cost. On the other hand, if you have a $50,000 average sale amount and a $500 cost per lead, you're not looking so bad. You're looking pretty good. What is that, 1%? Now you're looking pretty good. So you should be comparing your cost per lead to your average sale amount. You should be comparing it across your portfolio of shows that you do. You should be comparing it to uh, the B2B average cost of a lead. And by the way, I'm going to cover a lot fast, as we said. So remember, any time a question flashes in your mind, go to your question queue, type question, press send. You can send as many questions as you want and have multiple questions out in play at once. Okay, so that's one number. Here's another one. This revenue opportunity could be looked at from two ways, gain or loss. Okay, so if you will talk to your um, accounting department and ask what your average sale amount is, that would be a good number for you to know. Because now you could compare your cost per lead to it, but also you could use it to calculate potential revenue gain or loss. So here we go. So let's say that my average sale amount is $25,000. And let's say that I capture 150 leads at, at my last show. And let's say that my conversion rate on leads is 25%. One out of four converts to a, a deal or an order. That would be 38 orders. Uh, so the revenue opportunity for me is $950,000. It's almost a million dollars. 
Now, again, if I follow up, I follow up on my leads and I bring one out of four to conversion, this is a million bucks for my company. On the other hand, if we don't follow up and we don't bring these to conversion, that's a million dollars loss. Okay, so you got a lot to gain and you got a lot to lose here by getting control over this, this lead trade show lead management conundrum, if you will. Okay, and here's a big one, number three, and this one doesn't have a, I, I, I really can't put a dollar amount to this, but I can tell you this one's devastating. So let's say that I am a, uh, you know, one of the big um, companies in the industry, a potential buyer. I walk into your company's booth at Corrosion. I engage with your staff. I give them my information. I ask them to follow up, and they don't follow up. How do you think that impacts my perceptions as a customer of your company? More importantly, you do this enough. How do you think it's impacting your company's brand perceptions in the marketing uh, the marketplace? So as you can see, between cost per lead and potential revenue gain or loss, and the impact on your company's brand identity in the marketplace, there's a lot riding on this topic here. Okay? There's a lot riding on it. And I'm glad that you guys are out here today because given the total number of corrosion exhibitors that are in the show, uh, you'd be surprised how many aren't on here. You're going to have big time competitive advantage over companies who aren't paying attention to this topic. Okay? So let's get into uh, closed loop. And I and I'm using a visual image here of a circle, green, red, and blue, and I'm doing that for a reason. The first phase of closed loop lead management is the capture process. The game is high quality. How, how would I define a high quality lead? Information rich with a committed next action. Information rich, committed next action. How do you do that? We're going to give you some practices in a moment. Second, now by the way, I have that part in blue because I think that's the cold part of the process. I think this is the area that we can make radical improvements on. Second, in red, hot, speed, right? You got to get these, you got to route these leads quickly and efficiently to the right people for fast follow up. Write this note down the value of a trade show lead diminishes by 15% per week unless the visitor requested a longer follow-up window. Somebody walks in your booth, it takes you six weeks to vet the lead and follow up, odds are good that you've lost 90% of the value of the lead, 15% per week. You wait three weeks, you've lost 45% of the value. You've got to get these leads into the right people's hands fast and you've got to follow up on them fast. Okay, there's no time to delay here. Number three, the green, the money part of the closed loop is now the follow-up, okay, that whoever has ownership is following up and they're converting whatever the commitment we got in the boo, they're converting it to action. And that action ideally will be purchasing driven if ROI is the name of the game. And the fourth part of the money, uh, the green money part of the wheel here is uh, make it easy for the people that you're giving leads to, make it easy for them to report progress and the ultimate sales conversion. So I want to ask you right now, as you look at these four phases, if you had to very quickly self-assess a five, very effective, a one, ineffective. If you had to score your closed loop management on a one to five on these four criteria, how would you score it? What's your capture look like? One to five. What's your routing look like? One to five. What's your follow-up process, procedure look like? One to five. What does your reporting look like? One to five. Anywhere you scored below five, being very effective, would be a hole or a gap in your lead management. Half of Success is just identifying your gaps. So if you use my simple scoring method there now, you can think, okay, I've got to improve this, this, this. For some of you, you've got to improve all four of these. For some of you, maybe it's only in improving the quality. Uh, so it could be one or it could be a combination of these factors that are 
limiting your ability to get maximum ROI from trade shows. Okay, so that's why we're doing all this today. So let's start off in this definition, okay? What is and what isn't a lead? What is a lead? There was personal interaction. Somebody from your staff engaged them. Key qualifying questions were asked. The answers were captured, documented, and the next step was identified and agreed to by the visitor. You give me 50 of those, I'll convert 15 to 20 to business consistently. You give me 500 badge swipes or scans with no engagement and no additional information. Business cards dropped in a fishbowl to, you know, for a contest. Business cards that end up in somebody's pocket and I don't even know that I, that, that I got the lead. You give me 500 of those, I'll be lucky to convert five. Okay, so let's make clear, here's the takeaway. Let's make sure that everybody in our company, when we say lead, trade show lead, we're saying information rich with a committed next action step. We have four criteria everybody knows. Okay, that's how you begin to turn this thing around. Because again, a lot of what people are calling leads are not really leads. They're more like scans or swipes or contestants. Or sometimes, hey, sometimes people will give your booth staff their card to scan to get out of the interaction, <laughs> to get the booth staffer to stop talking. Okay, so let's make sure when we say leads, let's be crystal clear on what we mean. This is a game changer, okay? Uh, next, um, many of us either weren't setting lead goals or, or somewhat. I'm going to demystify the process for you on how to set lead goals. Here we go. Grab your pen, grab your calculator. Okay. There's a, for, the, the, there's a, a term that we call exhibit interaction capacity. It is a formula that calculates the physical number of interactions face-to-face -face that you can handle in your exhibit. Okay, so we use this formula to set our lead goals. So here's what I want you to do, okay? Um, Corrosion has 19 exhibiting hours. How many people are going to be in your booth on average consistently over those 19 hours? Write that number. In my example, three. Multiply those two together and you have your total staff hours. That is your capacity for interaction. Now, big question, the, the, the second variable in green. How, how many interactions per hour per staffer should you target or expect? Well, here's uh, almost 30 years of experience working with hundreds and hundreds of companies in every industry you can imagine. Three interactions per hour per staffer, conservative. Four interactions per hour per staffer, moderate. Five interactions per hour per staffer, aggressive. I want you to pick one of those numbers, three, four, or five. Now you multiply that by your total staff hours and you have got your exhibit interaction capacity or the total number of face-to-face, one-to-one interactions you can generate. Not all of those will convert to leads. Some percentage will. Uh, a safe starting point, if you have not used this type of methodology before, is one out of four convert to a lead. Okay? So now you're beginning to get the picture here. By the end of Corrosion Expo, we will have captured at least 57 qualified leads. Now, what is my booth staff's role here? It, can I use this tool to drive my booth staff? Yes. Now, what I tell my booth staff is, hey, for every hour you're in the booth, I need one lead per hour per staffer. Look how simple that gets. This formula is amazingly accurate, too. If you've never applied this the first time you do, and you really get your staff to understand it and buy into it, you're going to be amazed at what happens. I just came off a show floor recently where we had a goal of 424 leads by closing time. We walked off the show with 441. How's that for accurate? <laughs> we also beat our goal by a little bit, which is a celebration. You know? So that's good. So that's how you set goals. Um, 
You know, it's it's all about faith. It, real leads we're talking about. Somebody coming by and dropping their business card, that's not a lead. Somebody entering a contest, not a lead. You know, we've defined the four criteria that make a lead. You get 57 of those, and you are going to have one of the best shows in your company's history. Okay? Set goals, communicate them with your staff, measure daily, and you're on your way to getting control over trade show lead management. Okay, now... Write this phrase down. Don't just accept what is embedded in the badge. You need to know what's embedded in the badge. Uh, talk to the show organizer. Talk to the um, lead uh, retrieval company. What information is embedded in the badge? And that is your starting point. Okay. You want to think beyond that and 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 build what we call custom qualifiers. Okay, so what information would be useful for you to capture? Do they have a specific need, project, or application? Are there specific requirements or specs? You got multiple products? What are they interested in? And how high is the interest? What is their role or influence in your product service? Uh, who is the evaluation or the decision team? What competitors are they looking at? Is money, budget, funding, uh, their time frame in terms of evaluation and making decisions and follow-up? Uh, their email address, which is often not embedded in the badge, you know. Uh, and what other information would be useful for you to capture? Here's my best advice on this topic. If you really want to get your sales team to buy into your trade show program, go to them and say, hey, we want to hand you super high quality leads from trade shows. To do that, we need your help. Tell us what information you would like to see us capture in the leads that would make you better value the lead. If you get your sales team's involvement in the creation or the improvement, their buy-in and their usage of it will go way up. Okay? So key practice there. Some ways to get your sales team to support lead management. Number one is uh, communicate that you are beginning a total lead quality improvement program. Okay, we are not going to accept junk leads and we're not going to send junk leads to the field. We're going for quality. Okay, next, calculate and share your cost per lead. If you paid $500 for a lead and you hand it to a sales rep, they need to know that. Okay, you hand them 10 of those leads, you're handing them $5,000 of company capital. They need to know it and they need to treat it as if you gave them a company check that needed to get into the bank by Friday. Okay. I'm a big believer in setting three firm post-show reporting dates. Three firm dates, 30, 60, 90, 45, 90, 180. Okay, set firm reporting dates. Uh, if you do not have a culture of accountability, then using contests as a way to kind of kickstart this. You could have a tiered contest at the 30, at the 60, at the not, or whatever your three reporting dates are. And then... Um, if you sell through uh, independent dealers or, or non-exclusive distributors or independent reps, and if, they, and if they're not following up and they're not reporting on your leads, uh, after you've gone through most of these pre-steps and you can't get them to comply, you might want to start selling them your trade show leads. You paid $500 for an information-rich, committed next step lead. Give it to them for free. They do nothing with it. That's not working. Maybe they should have pay twenty-five, fifty, hundred dollars. Tell you what, if they know the lead has real value and has revenue potential for their company, you'll be surprised if that might not work. Okay. So some things to get kind of you know people on board with uh, supporting your lead management process. All right. Uh, I want to launch my second poll of the uh, session here, and I want to find out how you currently capture leads in the booth. Uh, the physical tool that you use. Okay, I'm launching the poll as we speak. Take a moment, click the radio dial button that applies.
All right, we're at uh, 77% of you have uh, completed the poll. Those of you who haven't, take a moment, look back with me, uh, click the radio dial button that applies, and I'm going to share this in just a moment. And then we're going to talk about the five generations of lead capture devices. So here we go. Thanks, everybody. We're at 83% vote. Thank you so much. All right, so what's happening out here? Let's share. 6% of us are renting and customizing the show's lead retrieval system. Uh, congratulations. Uh, that is almost as good as you can get in terms of you're not only using the capture system, but you're customizing it. Okay, 33%, one out of three of you on here today are renting the system. 22% uh, are using a paper form, and 39% are um, using, biz using business cards as the capture device. So let's talk about this for a moment here, okay? All right, here we go. When you think about devices and you think about the generations, okay, it, it, the, the first generation is business cards. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't take business cards. I'm just saying they shouldn't be your primary capture device for many reasons. Number one, how much um, information can you um, attach or write on somebody's business card? Answer, not much. Um, how often do business cards end up in somebody's pocket and you, di you don't even know the lead was captured? Answer, too often. Um, does the business card guide the booth staffer in asking the right questions? Does it make it easy for the visitor to capture information? No. And I'm going to give you another thought here on business cards. You've met a prospective new customer at your first interaction with them. You're coming to the end of the interaction. They hand you their badge to scan, and you can't scan it. Now, I want you to pause and get out of your lens or view, and I want you to step into their lens or view, and I want you to ask yourself, what impression might that be sending to the visitor? It's not good, okay? Um, whenever an electronic system is available, I think you absolutely should have it. I, it's kind of like going on a first date and not showing up dressed properly or groomed properly. You don't want any speed bumps this early in the relationship. Okay, so I would suggest that you augment minimally with a paper-based lead form. There's some great advantages to that in terms of portability, in terms of really designing the question flow and making it easy to check circle like the example on the screen on the left. Uh, but I still think we need to be able to capture it electronically, okay, uh, running, the, uh, running the system. And ideally, we will use customizers, uh, cus you know, custom qualifiers. We'll, you know, we'll think about what do we need to uh, capture that's not embedded in the badge that is unique to our company and build the qualifiers. L listen to this uh, uh, statistic. According to the largest lead retrieval company in North America last year, 6% of exhibitors used custom qualifiers. 94% didn't. I got a rule of success. You want to succeed? Find out what the average are doing and don't do it. The average exhibitor is not customizing their capture device. I think it is mistake colossal. I think you should bridge that yesterday. Okay? The fourth option is a buying a universal lead capture system. That may or may, may or may not make sense depending on how big your company is and how many shows you're doing. And the movement today is the smartphone and tablet technology through apps and uh, QR codes and barcode readers. And, there, that's, that, and that's all emerging very quickly as uh, this whole thing expands. So what I want to do at this point is I, I want to bring on the official show um, lead retrieval vendor. And we're not here to sell you anything today, by the way. But we do think it's important that you're aware of what is available, what the choices are. Uh, and, and, and where to go to and who to ask questions. So with that, I'm going to bring uh, Maria on, and I've got Chris on from Expo Badge. Chris, Maria, take it away. Hi, Jefferson. Thanks a lot for having us today. Um, 
I'm Chris Andrews, and uh, Maria is with me as well. Uh, Expo Badge was started in 1985 by a person who was a medical sales rep at trade shows and uh, had trouble collecting and keeping track of all his leads through the business card method and decided he wanted to start a better system for people. We are an exhibitor-centric company. We focus all our technology on making exhibitors excel at trade shows. Um, we uh, um, have what we call instant leads, which gives uh, exhibitors the ability to instantly follow up on leads, and that helps with your uh, closed loop system. Fast follow up is critical. We offer custom qualifiers. We offer the mobile app, and I'm going to let Maria uh, take it from here and, and discuss with you some of the equipment options that we have. Thanks very much. Hello, everybody. So new this year is we definitely have new equipment offering at Corrosion. Um, this equipment was not offered last year at the event, so I do want to just go over and review um, the handheld scanners. All the handheld scatter, scanners are battery operated, so no electricity is needed in the booth. The big key difference between the Expo Badge Elite and the Exceed, both handheld units they both keep a date and timestamp of the lead captured. They display the barcode information that's encoded, uh, or the encoded information on the display screen. The Elite, um, both of them are, um, excuse me, the Exceed, the difference between the Elite and the Exceed. The Exceed has custom note taking. So once you scan the badge and you want to add additional information or customize that lead, as Jefferson had mentioned, you can go ahead and add uh, additional notes using the touch screen pad on the Expo Badge Exceed. The Elite does not offer customized notes. And we also have the wireless printer add-on. So you can take the, um, it's a battery printer and you can add it to the Elite or the Exceed, as many of you want, to each unit. And it's really based on preference. What do exhibitors like to do? Do they like to key in the customized notes, or do they actually like to hand write on the paper copy of the lead? So it's basically just another added option for what works best in your booth. We are also offering the mobile app, and that is an app that we, we basically email in advance with a test barcode. We do encourage all the exhibitors to use the test barcode in advance to familiarize yourself with how to use your own device. Um, super easy and all options do provide instant leads. So whoever we have as an email contact in the company profile, we will send out an email uh, with a web portal. So on that first day of the expo opening, your first badge scan, you will receive an email from us with a web portal. That link you can click on during the event, you know, daily or post event, and you can download the leads in Excel, CSV, or text format. And then something else that we do have um, that are added options to the device. Delivery setup and training. So we can come out to your booth and deliver the unit and train your staff if you prefer. That is an additional charge, but we don't, of course, charge if you want to come to our booth and pick up the unit. We also offer personalized action codes. So when you pick up the scanner from our lead retrieval staff, we give you 20 standard uh, codes that are used within the industry, complementary. So for instance, you want to add it to a mailing list. They're a hot lead. Uh, somebody is inquiring about a product, an interested buyer. We give you, again, 20 complementary codes. If you want to personalize your codes or customize it, then we charge you a fee for up to 20 different personalized action codes. And those Basically, the way that it works is you scan the barcode of the attendee, you scan as many action codes that apply to that particular guest, and all those action codes are in the file, the electronic file that we email off to you. And that kind of sums it up on the, um, the different units. 
If you guys have any questions, please feel free to go ahead and, and send those in. All right. Uh, a couple questions here. Um, one of them is, um, will the NACE uh, scans include email addresses and phone numbers? Yes. Last year they did include the, um, I'm going to go over the fields from last year. We're in the process of doing batch testing this month, and I believe the fields are going to be the exact same. So the fields that were delivered back to the exhibitors were first name, last name, company, address one, address 2, city, state, zip, country, phone, fax, email. Okay, thank you. So, and, and that's also a function, Maria, of whether or not when the attendee fills out the registration form, it's a function of whether or not they submit that information too, right? Exactly. That's a great point because if there's a field that is missing, it's not because we yeah, you know, we didn't encode it. It's because during the registration process, that person left off that key field. Um, so we deliver exactly what the attendee has filled out in those those specific fields. Okay, thank you. Uh, question: uh, How exactly does the mobile app compare to the Elite? Uh, what's different about the mobile app uh, versus the Elite and the Exceed? Really, the difference is you're using, you are using your own device. So if you want to use your own phone or if you want to use your own tablet to capture the, the lead, it's very similar. It's your own device. Um, so you have to keep in mind how big is your booth, how many salespeople are going to be on the floor. Um, you know, a lot of people for bigger booths prefer not to use the app because that would mean that Either you have to stay planted at the sales at the booth itself with your own device, um, and again, that may interfere if somebody's trying to call you. You can't answer the phone when you're trying to scan uh, the barcode on from the registrant. So it's just you're using your own device, but you pay uh, for an app based on the barcode specific for corrosion. Okay, uh, thank you. I appreciate it, Maria. That's all we've got for questions now. Uh, we're, we're running a few minutes uh, behind. I've got just a few more best practices, takeaways, and then we'll come back and uh, revisit the Q&A. So, uh, Maria, Chris, thanks a million. If you want to hang around for the final Q&A, it should only be less than five minutes. All right, so uh, uh, next key point here, best practice. Not all leads are created equal, okay? Uh, I think it's important that we develop a grading system. On the screen, you are seeing a, a very simplified example of how to use different criteria like the time frame, funding, or the role in the buying to assign a grading code. So now when you say it's an A lead, it's not an A lead because they were excited and gave you their card to scan. It's not an A lead just because they said follow up next week. It's an A lead because there's a time frame for purchase of zero to three months. They, there is funding or budget in, that's been specified or secured. You are talking to somebody who has final say or specification role. Uh, and this is just an example to give you a way to think about building your own lead scoring or grading system. Uh, next, you got to train your staff on this. You can't just put, uh, put together this lead improvement program and hope and pray that they're just going to take it by the uh, take it. So number one, communicate why you're building the system, ROI, value, and what's in it for them. Better quality leads, more sales. Uh, we talked earlier, build accountability by setting lead goals. Um, make sure you, whatever device you're using, make sure you give your booth staff the chance to do a little bit of hands-on role-playing with it before the show opens. If you just hand them an electronic device and go use this in the line of fire when they're standing with their, with a the customer, they're not going to do it. So make sure they, they do it. And again, I mentioned earlier about contests. Big believer in setting daily and end of show and lead follow-up contests as a way to get everybody excited about embracing our closed loop system. Next, best practice. Somebody's got to wear the hat. See the guy up in the corner here with a hat and a cigar? He's the guy that you do not want to go to at 5 o'clock at the end of the day and tell him you were supposed to get eight leads and you only got four, okay? So you want a lead captain, and that person has several responsibilities, which are communicated on the screen, 
and also in your workbook, one of the key ones of these would be that this person is monitoring the lead goal and on either a half day or end of day, and he or she is acknowledging those who are achieving, and he's correcting those who are not performing. Okay. Uh, next big point. Um, one of the big reasons for poor lead follow-up is uh, sending junk leads to the field. Uh, let's not do that. Okay. Uh, many companies today will implement a post-show qualification process post-show requalification where they are maybe using phone or email to just verify the information that was captured in the booth and also fill in any information gaps that weren't uh, got. Move the leads fast. We said, uh, you know, now today's with technology, the ability to move it from the booth into the CRM and to the rep's hands. For some people, by the, you know, the, the evening of the show, literally, for others a day or two after the show. Make sure you give whoever's receiving the leads, make sure you give them all the relevant data that you captured. The more information you give someone, the, the higher they're going to value the lead. Um, if you have a CRM system, you can manage routing through there, whether it's a, a software-based or a web-based app. Uh, or maybe it's as simple as a spreadsheet. Maybe you've got a spreadsheet that has all the leads on page one and you have a, a tab or a page for each region or rep who receives. Uh, but make sure that you're moving the leads. Uh, your culture of reporting, we talked about this already, communicating cost per lead. W one of the best practices is informing uh, their managers. Hey, I sent Michael 12 leads from the show. Our cost was uh, $500. Uh, you know, he's got 6,000 a company's capital. We'd like you to, you know, m stay on top, make sure he follows up. Already mentioned contests. Your end of shift and your end of day in booth meeting is so important that somebody stops halfway through the day, are we ahead, are we behind, are we capturing enough, not enough, and kind of reminds everybody, and then that end of day in the booth. Uh, you know, it only takes 10, 15 minutes, but it's priceless time. And then you as the exhibits manager should be running the close of show report, where you're documenting our goal and how many we captured, you're, you're communicating your cost per lead, calculating and communicating, you're breaking down the total number and splitting it out by ABC coding, and you're calculating the potential revenue value of the leads so you can communicate to marketing and sales management uh, the value of the program. Final point, big one, maybe the most important point. I could do an entire webinar on this single slide. You should prepare your lead follow-up plan before you get to the show. One of the big reasons for the 26-day lag is that we often haven't thought through in advance what we're going to do with these leads. So at a high level, you want to say, okay, I've got an A, a B, and a C grading. Uh, so what media, mail, email, telephone, what, what website, YouTube, social media, what messaging, what are we going to communicate through these media, what is the time frame for each of these touch points, uh, who is going to be driving these touch points, and if you're using any form of CRM, you probably have the ability to automate a lot of your follow-up tracks by priority. Okay, uh, so we've covered a lot of ground, and yet at times I feel like we're only scratching the surface. Um, this is a, a final chance to submit questions before we close today's webinar. Uh, remember two things if you're going to log off right now, that the Exhibitor ROI Center uh, is free. Uh, NACE is investing because they want you to succeed. Uh, we've got webinars, articles, uh, interactive email Q&A, the Exhibitor Invites program. Make sure you've bookmarked. Share it with everybody on your team and be sure to check back there frequently. Um, and then um, most importantly, use what you learned, okay? So I'm going to take one more look in the question queue. And while I do, um, let me bring uh, Jackie back on. Jackie, you still with me? And Maria and uh, Chris, are, yes. there, I am. there you are, Jackie, um, any closing yeah. uh, thoughts or comments from NACE about this trade show? Just uh, uh, like you said, I would love for uh, everyone to go ahead and visit the NACE um, website. Um, please, you know, share this with any of you, your colleagues at work, because there's a lot of great information here. 
It will help you um, with your exhibits there at the show. So, you know, if you have any questions with anything that has to do with your booth or your, your kit or this, our website, please give me a call. I'm here and myself, uh, it's myself and David. So please call us here at NACE. And I still, I want to thank you all for attending this webinar. Yeah, and, and you know, um, th thank you, Jackie, too. You know, myself as an exhibitor over the years, having exhibited over 200 shows, I always felt the only time I ever really heard from the show organizer is when they wanted to check or when they sent me that service kit telling me everything I had to do and didn't want to do. So how cool is it, all of you listening today, to be exhibiting uh, with a great organization like NACE and Jackie and David, people that care, right, enough uh, to make the investment of financial and time resources to really help us as exhibitors. So my hat's off to you guys. Um, Chris and uh, Maria, I want to thank you for joining. Were there any closing uh, thoughts or comments about lead capture you'd like to share? I just want to remind all the exhibitors that the early bird discount deadline ends on February 15th, so place your order before then to save a little bit of extra cash. All right, thank you. And um, yeah, that early bird deadline, make sure you do that. And again, pick up the phone and call um, you know, the team at Expo Badge. They, they want the same thing that we want is for you to succeed as exhibitors. So um, make sure you use the resource, okay? You don't want somebody walk in your booth, hand you that badge, and you can't scan it. I'm very serious about that. Uh, and that has nothing to do with revenue to Expo Badge. It has everything to do with you, the exhibitor, and the impression you're making and increasing the odds of you winning, winning the business. I've got two questions I'll hit, and then we'll wind this thing down. Uh, question number one was, are contests effective? Um, they can be, but here's the thing. I don't want somebody at my booth because they want to win something. I want them at my booth because they want to learn how we can help them solve a problem or seize an opportunity. So if you are going to use a contest as part of your lead capture process, I would suggest that you attach qualifying questions to the con whether it is a paper form, an electronic, uh, you know, an, an app on an iPhone or an iPad, that you attach three to five qualifying questions and you put a, uh, a disclaimer on there that says all questions must be answered to qualify for the contest. I don't want contestants. I want information rich leads. So if you're going to use contests, um, don't just drop business card here for chance to win. Those aren't leads, those are contestants. Okay, uh, I got another one. I think it's a comment and a question. It's in terms of lead grading, I was surprised uh, that revenue potential was not included as one of the parameters. Uh, great question. Um, why was it not included? Often it can be hard to tell at the point of contact what the potential revenue value of the lead is. Okay, now if you can get that information, then, then include it. And, and remember also those three parameters I gave you in the sample lead grading were just that. They were samples. We were using time frame, budget, and purchase influence. But you certainly could, if you can assess the potential value of the lead, you definitely could use that as a grading code. So that was an example. Okay, so I hope that helps. That is all I'm seeing for questions. I want to thank everybody for logging in. I want to wish you a happy new year. I want you to go out there and knock them dead. Have a tremendous Corrosion Expo. I will be there. If you want to uh, interact with me, feel free to drop me an email. I'd be happy to drop by your booth and spend a few minutes with you while I'm there. Uh, go get them. Use what you learned, and I look forward to seeing you at Corrosion. Thanks for logging in, everybody.